floodlit beneath the stainless firmament, anointed with iodine and rendered unto a pride of paper-helmeted gods. My breastbone is parted, heart unsheathed, and everything unredressed is clarified in blood so it can seem Odysseus parts the surf, naked, rind, no syntax in his step, forward a thrust and heel, just all in now. Then, in morphine twilight, domed under bruised stars, my wound begins to blossom, and I strain to uncuff and probe beneath the gown. I die, I think. It could be a child's fingers trace the livid slash, a cave figure or totem. It could be my stitched chest is a chirograph, metastasizing into memoir. Thus my body transcribed rocks, backward washed clean of birth, forward into days charted by lines, backward like a wave or a half rhyme, and forward into the summer of 265 when I first bent solemn to the page. That is the, the opening of the second chapter of a book-length poem in progress called To Banquet with the Worthy Ethiopians, a Memoir of Life Before the Alphabet. And it takes place in what the narrator calls the summer of 265, a time when, the, when, when he's 12 years old. And he's crossing that divide from childhood's all in now to adulthood's sense of time, which is past, present, and future lineated. And it's a, it's a, some, it's a time, of course, it's a, a crossing that we all make personally and usually under the agency of the alphabet, uh, our encounter with uh, literature and with making things go forward is one of those, uh, one of those factors which separates um, myth and time. Uh, the, uh, the boy's uh, encounter comes with a prose translation by W.H.D. Rouse of the Iliad. And he can't really understand it, but he wants to read the Iliad because he believes that within it is the secret to manhood. Somehow there's something in it that he needs to know. He does understand some sections. One in particular stays with him. It's a section in book two, uh, which I read from the last, uh, the last residency, book two of the Iliad, where a foot soldier named Thersites uh, cries and complains and wants to go home. And he is beaten and humiliated by Odysseus in front of the army. The boy understands this because these same dynamics prevail in the camp where he was uh, living. And uh, he can relate to, to Thersites. Uh, this, the summer of 265 is listed as 265 because of a list that the adult writer has made, a list of shame, which is a very long list. And item 265 on that list of all the shameful things that have happened to him is a single word, Thersites, and it sends him back to the summer of 265. The name of the chapter is chirograph, which is the word for the world of print, things chirographic having to do with print, and it also has to do with a, uh, a paper, a single piece of paper that's torn with writing on both sides so that when they fit together, they make a whole. And I'm going to read some, 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 share some passages from Chirograph. You'll hear Homeric names, which the boy attributes to the camp counselor, and the man attributes to the figures in the hospital where he's just undergone heart surgery. 
master of mimicry, librarian of jokes, magician who disrobed the queen of hearts. Odysseus was thick as a fire plucked, sprouting waves of hair from every cranny. When Reveille blared, he shambled bear like into the pine cabin, and the runts at mock attention exchanged smirks. He sallied from untucked sheets to untied shoes, ferreting each angle, wagging his ass. You, fearless! He hooked the boy's shorts. How about a spin around the world? Nose to humid nose, the hero leered, his underhand torquing elastic. Fearless back arched. Uncle, he fluted. And as the ungendered voice box climbed a tent, it thinned to Ithaca, at least to me. Ringed in 265 by a squad of pups, I fantasize as Homeric, forever 12 years old and shrilling home. Knowing this, the camp counselor Odysseus, himself shipwrecked in time, had named us all Winkles, Parboil, Anteater, Roto Rooter, Bam Bam, Floss based on our gear, and the names stuck. Odysseus licked his lips, snapped fearless free. Cleaving the bruised dawn of 265, my chirograph unseals. One lip oozes blood-flecked dactyls. One's dumb. Thus, Parting the curtain of intensive care, Odysseus moons, spanks his heart tattoo. Magisterial, flanked by his entourage, the chief heart surgeon Agamemnon enters the bruised light. No eyes survey the gleaming steel and tile, scan blips cascading down a screen. With talismanic stethoscope he bends, and I stare into the deathless countenance. Outside the shaded window, in the world parenthesized by moon and cup, everyone knows Schliemann's golden mask. He is the unctuous provost, the officious clerk, the platinum glaze of the highway patrolman shades. But having dipped sterile hands into my chest, as if it were a sacrificial bowl. Agamemnon is present as a force, just as he was, summer of 265. In that far summer, sown into my list, Agamemnon loved camp life. He loved the beach and bottle-sharded asphalt, the creaking seesaw and the monkey bars. The police athletic league was a divinity in whose clay heart nothing's bent or twisted, and all was his, firstborn of the camp's owner. Under the command of Agamemnon, the day was seized, parsed to period, thrusting, no healing back, marshalling hours into weeks and months, Homer skips in Rouse's plain English. The only respite to worm deep in bed or woods or corner of a field and rub the gashed and pasted over paperback cover with its warrior plume, then thumbed through phalanxed paragraphs, always returning to the dog-eared page where Thersihis rocks and chants before the army, let us all be whole, be one, let us all sail home. To make me whole and sail me back into time, they hover round my bed, my wife and <clears throat> friends, weaving the tale of the day I was unsheathed. Gorgons they saw and goddesses and fiends, and all this on the waiting room TV. One face I think they never glimpsed, the day I lived through the years Homer forgot. It appears in morphine twilight, dilating in the eons in between the monitor's blip, between the impossible push to rock forward and the infinitesimal collapse into the shroud, when pain gags and the instrument dials spin and the pulse at the nape of my neck throbs black. It is the unsheathed face 
of death-dealing Achilles. Gaunt as the new moon's beak, Achilles gleams, just as he did first night in 265, after the station wagons had set sail, and the crickets had let loose their hideous screech, and shadows tensed to snakes and tarantulas, and each boy found his stripling heart palpitating wildly out of time. At the edge of a strip of woods, the hero lowered, mantled in a dark, no flash light pierced. Like shards to a magnet, so we closed to circle him, the champion Achilles. Reaching into his camouflage fatigues, he unsheathed a long, bone-handled knife, twice notched, arabesqued with runes. I'm going back, he stared into the woods. Find me, and you can have the knife. He stroked the beveled flank and set his thumb on the serrated teeth, then cocked his arm and flung the weapon deep into the night. And so it arcs through time to pierce the heart Agamemnon bared and Odysseus slapped to life. It's sunk in earth or flesh. Its chirograph divides the howling myrmidons who chased from the boy who stayed, watching the blade soar into a darkness bruised with flashlight beams.